Six million pilgrims visit the Fatima Shrine every year. Most of these visitors stay only one or two nights, not knowing there are so many more interesting things to discover about this historical place. Join us as we explore not only the religious places in and around Fatima, but also the attractive historical sites and gastronomical delights it offers. Good day, I'm Veronica Baluit Jimenez and welcome to Who's Calling? It's been over a hundred years after the apparitions of our Blessed Mother in Fatima, but stories of miracles and healings abound among pilgrims that continue to flock to this sanctuary. Standing tall in this vast shrine is the Basilica of Our Lady of the Rosary. Inside the Basilica are the tombs of the two shepherd children, Francisco and Jacinta, who were declared saints of the Catholic Church on May 13, 2017 by Pope Francis. The Chapel of Apparitions stands where the oak tree used to be, the spot where the Blessed Mother appeared to the three seers. Right across the basilica is the much larger basilica of the Holy Trinity, designed to accommodate large groups of pilgrims going on their retreat. On the 100th anniversary of the Fatima apparitions in 2017, tourist arrivals reached 9.4 million people. One of the high points of a pilgrim's visit here is the evening candle procession. The image of Our Lady of Fatima is brought around the sanctuary while devotees carrying candles sing and pray the rosary. If they would come to Fatima, I would recommend them to say three um, They should go at least to the candle procession a couple of nights. It's the high point of, of the day, is uh, you know, that uh, point where people uh, uh, Lighting the, the candle and they pray at night. It's, I think it's one of the most extraordinary experiences they can find. The Vice President of the Assiso Business Association in Fatima, Alex Marto Pereira, also recommends that each tourist stay at least three nights in Fatima. He said this will give them time to visit some of the beautiful UNESCO World Heritage Sites that are located just half an hour away from Fatima itself. So Fatima is, of course, the main purpose of visits is, is religious. Mm -hmm. So it is one of the main religious sites in the world. But for those that are looking also for a cultural perspective and looking for, for instance, for fantastic architectural uh, uh, sites, they can be reached from Fatima very easily. There are at least three historic religious monuments near Fatima that are listed among the UNESCO World Heritage Sites. One of them is a splendid Alcobasa monastery which was built in the 12th century and tells of a tragic tale. The Alcobasa monastery is one of the most important monasteries here in Portugal and it's also one of the most beautiful. It tells of a bizarre love story between King Pedro and his mistress Ines. The story goes that uh, King Pedro was arranged to be married to a Spanish princess. But then the Spanish princess brought with her a very beautiful lady in waiting. And so naturally, Pedro fell in love with the mistress. So at that time, Pedro was not yet king. And his father, the king, ordered the assassination of Ines. And so when uh, Pedro became king, he exhumed the body of Ines and crowned her queen of Portugal. And he paraded her remains around and made the uh, noble people kiss her hand. And now they are buried in this Alcobasa monastery. Today, the beautifully carved tombs of King Pedro and Doña Ines de Castro face each other across the transepts of the church. The tombs were positioned as such so that on Judgment Day, the first sight they have is of each other. This great Gothic church was a gift of King Alfonso Henriquez to the Cistercian reformer St. Bernard of Clairvaux, author of the Memorare Prayer shortly before his death in 1153. Aside from the tombs of Pedro and Ines, a separate royal pantheon contains the tombs of Queen Uraca, wife of Alfonso I, Queen Beatrice, wife of Alfonso III, and several unidentified princes. 
Inside the room of the kings are tiles showing the allegory of the foundation of Portugal and the abbey. Statues of kings also adorn this room. The monastery has several beautiful courtyards as well as picturesque hallways. Significant cloisters were added in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. One of the most memorable is a kitchen with its enormous tiled chimney that sits on eight iron pillars. It is big enough to roast three oxen at one time. The water basin allowed fish to be channeled directly into the kitchen where they are caught right before they are cooked. In the small town of Batala sits a gigantic jewel in Gothic architecture, the Monastery of Our Lady of Victory. It took over a century to build this Monastery of Batalha or Monastery of Battle. It was King John I that built this monastery after the battle in 1385 where the Portuguese won against the Castilians and he decided to build this to thank the Virgin Mary for the victory of the Portuguese against the Castilians. This UNESCO World Heritage Site is a shining example of filigree stonework and extraordinary design. There are quite a number of ornate archways that lead to chapels and chambers. The Royal Cloister displays the beginnings of Manuelin style in its exceptional carvings. A number of elegant tombs including that of King John or Joao and his English Queen Philippa of Lancaster may be seen at the Chapel of Founders. Their carved figures lie hand in hand under an octagon. Nearby is the tomb of their famous son, Henry the Navigator. One of the halls is dedicated to the unknown Portuguese fallen soldiers of World War I. Tailored gardens surround the monastery. The statue of General Nuno Alvarez, a key player commemorating the Battle of Batalha, stands tall right outside the monastery. Seven chapels lie unfinished. Among them is the unfinished pantheon of King Duarte, the son of King John. In 1433, King Duarte commissioned the building of his pantheon because he wanted him, his wife, and the rest of his family to be buried here. However, he died before it was finished, and the founding kings were not interested in finishing this because of the amount of money involved. And this is just the doorway. See how intricate it is? But up to this day, it remains unfinished, although the king and his wife are very good. The magnificent walls of the unfinished chapels show the intricate carvings begun in 1434. The entrance of the chapel, though unfinished, is breathtaking. The funeral chapel was intended to consolidate King Duarte's lineage and personal legacy. However, he died in 1437, putting a stop to the construction of this particular chapel. In the reign of King Manuel, the seven funeral chapels were completed in the early years of the 16th century. The vaults show carved keystones with a coat of arms and emblems of their occupants. The third monastery in the vicinity of Fatima is a Tomar castle. It is another UNESCO World Heritage Site. This is Tomar Castle in Portugal. It used to be the home of the Templar Knights, but when the French king asked the Pope to stop the Templar Knights, the Templar Knights changed their name to the Order of Christ, and it was here where they lived under the Order of Christ and under the leadership of uh, Prince Henry the Navigator. The Templar Knights were tasked to protect pilgrims in the Holy Land on their journey from the port of Jaffa to Jerusalem. In 1417, Henry the Navigator became its Grand Master and used the order for the voyages of discovery. Today, the order is active in Portugal and Brazil and is conferred on individuals for outstanding service. The Templars even today are shrouded in mysticism. Much of this is due to their earliest origins and the relics that the order is said to have discovered including the Ark of the Covenant, the Holy Grail, and the mummified head of John the Baptist. Overlooking the attractive town of Tamar is a convent of Christ. It boasts of a unique Romanesque round church. The interior of the round church is decorated with magnificent Gothic paintings and sculpture. The knights use this church exclusively. It is said that they attended Mass on horseback. The castle has several museum shops selling wine, cheese, toys relating to the Templar Knights, shirts, and costumes. 
The charming quaint town of Tamar is set along the Nabao River. Tourists will enjoy a walk through the town with its pretty cobbled streets and traditional houses. At the Central Park, an ancient water wheel used for hydropower still survives. Forty-five minutes by car from Fatima is a picturesque seaside village of Nazare along the Silver Coast or Costa da Prata. The place is known for its religious festivals dedicated to Our Lady of Nazare. This little chapel used to be a grotto. It was here where we found the little Madonna, now known as a miraculous Our Lady of Nazare. According to a document found in the grotto, the statue of the Virgin and Child were believed to have been sculpted by Saint Joseph and painted by Saint Luke. The Black Madonna was brought to Nazare in the 4th century from Nazareth. According to legend, the Blessed Mother intervened to save the life of a Portuguese knight. And because of this, a chapel was built to commemorate this by King Fernando I during the 14th century. And uh, the interior of the church was transformed splendidly throughout the centuries. A separate church of Our Lady of Nazare was built to house the statue. Pilgrims continue to flock to the church to see the statue that is placed on an elaborate Baroque altarpiece with gilded ceiling. Tourists usually take the funicular to get to the church. There are a number of good restaurants in the area that serve fresh seafood. Many come to Nazare to enjoy the beach and the scenery. It is one of the top serving spots in Portugal. Located at Lisbon's Belém district is another UNESCO World Heritage Site, the St. Jerome Monastery. This monastery was built during the Age of Discoveries to honor explorer Vasco da Gama. In the 17th century, monks stayed in the monastery to comfort the sailors and pray for the king. Eventually, it was turned into a school and an orphanage. Today, Tourists visit the place to admire the highly ornate architecture and intricately carved pillars and vaulted ceilings. The chapel contains the tombs of some royals and that of Vasco da Gama himself. A symbol of Portuguese imperial power and a work of art is the Tower of Belém. King John II had the tower constructed at the northern bank of the Tagus River. It was part of a defense system to ward off pirates eyeing the riches of the area. It was also a ceremonial gateway to Lisbon. The district of Belém is also famous for the custard of Belém or pastel de nata. Catholic monks at the St. Jerome Monastery created the dessert during the 18th century. Convents and monasteries used large quantities of egg whites for starching habits of nuns. The leftover egg yolks were made into cakes and pastries, resulting in a proliferation of sweets throughout the country. Not far from here is the shrine of another famous saint. This is a church of San Antonio de Padua here in Lisbon. He is the only Portuguese doctor of the church and he's a well-known saint for lost things and marriage. His house is actually here and the church is built over his house. And he lived here until he was about 20 years old. Saint Anthony entered the monastery at age 15. He sailed from Morocco to follow the steps of Franciscan martyrs, but he fell ill and decided to return to Portugal. On his return journey, his ship was blown off course and he ended up in Sicily. He was nursed back to health by Franciscan friars and eventually came to the attention of Francis of Assisi. He established a community in Padua and served as papal envoy of the order. St. Anthony is credited for many miracles concerning recovery of items and missing persons. Newlywed couples come to this church to pray to St. Anthony to bless their marriage. Museum of Sacred Art and Ethnology in Fatima brings you to a journey of the history of the Christian faith and the Gospels. Its vast collection of sacred art and ethnography comes from various countries from all over the world. Here in the Nativity we have many, many child Jesus, yeah? and we have the different types of child Jesus. It's a collection that we, we collected, we received collections from many people. 
uh, many priests who have their collections, they offer to us. Sometimes we have to buy these collections. So we have pieces of the 14th, 15th, 16th century. Exhibited here are a huge collection of baby Jesus and the nativity scene. Figures from the Passion and Death of Our Lord are also displayed. The museum features the culture of the different indigenous peoples of Africa, where the missionarios, the consolata went. Fatima is also known for olive oil making. The story of olive oil making is told in this olive oil museum, which is run by a cooperative. They actually churn out 330 tons of olive oil within 24 hours. We can see here the old machines that they used to use in making the olive oil. These machines are around 60 years old, but now it is automated. So they have newer machines, that's why they're able to produce much, much more olive oil here in this region. This was the first olive oil press room in the region. The museum exhibits the excellently preserved machines used in the olden days. A guide tells visitors the step-by-step -step process of how olive oil was made decades ago. The museum also displays various products made from olives grown in this region. Honey, cheeses, wine and other local products are sold in the museum store. about five medieval castles that are less than an hour away from Fatima. One of them is in the town of Orem. This is what remains of the castle here in Orem. A count, his name was uh, Count Nino Alvarez Pereira, used to live here in the 14th century. Now it's just a tourist spot where people come and see whatever is left of it. The castle of Orem served as a watch post for the nearby castle Leiria an important stronghold at that time. After reaching its peak in the 15th century, the castle and the town of Orem reached a relative decline. The Lisbon earthquake in 1755 further damaged the castle. Now, the ruins of the castle have become a major attraction to tourists in the area. Lisbon is one of the oldest cities in the world. It is the largest city in Portugal and also its capital. For those wanting to see more cosmopolitan attractions, Lisbon offers a vibrant nightlife and more restaurants. Portuguese cuisine is famous for seafood. The country has a well-developed fishing industry. Perhaps because of its many conquests and discoveries during the ancient times, Portuguese dishes make use of a wide variety of spices. Most famous among its dishes is the bacalao, or the codfish that is cooked in many different ways. The national dish, the one that is most famous in Portugal is bacalhau. Bacalhau for Portuguese is a passion. Usually we say that we have 1,000 recipes, different recipes how to prepare the bacalhau. So each house, each place, each day has a different recipe. It's enough to have uh, three years almost of, of, um, of uh, different ways of uh, tasting bacalhau. It's really, really a national uh, passion. Then we have the seeds, the, the sweets. Um, I think you tasted the uh, creamy custards, the pastel de nata, and they are also a uh, national passion. More than that, the gastronomic, um, gastronomic um, culture in Portugal is so strong that I would say that you could offend almost any Portuguese if you say that you don't like the Portuguese food. You can say everything else. You can say bad things about the weather, about the culture, about whatever. But you can never say to a Portuguese that you don't like the food. Because we really think that our food is the best. If you're a meat lover, it is a must to try out Ocural Restaurante along a rural road junction in Orem. They cook a whole rib of beef on a hot stone beside your table. The steak is very tender, juicy and delicious. It comes with fresh salad and olive oil and a generous serving of French fries. Dessert is a lovely combination of fresh fruits and cake. The restaurant itself has a rustic ambiance with very good service. 
Restaurants and bake shops in Fatima offer a wide variety of desserts and pastries that are quite irresistible even for those without a sweet tooth. Cookies, cakes, custards and other sweets are displayed in glass counters in cafes. Many Portuguese have these for breakfast. In Fatima, there are a lot of shopping areas, many of them just outside the shrine. A wide array of religious items such as images of the Blessed Mother, saints, rosaries, and other souvenirs are sold. So we're in one of the stores here in Fatima. And since they have a lot of pork trees here, they have a lot of pork products like bags, wallets, sandals, even shoes and boots made of pork. Oh, there's even a fan made of pork. I was wondering what these were, and then I was told by the sales lady that these are the figures, for example, if you have a problem with your head, like uh, some disease in your head, then you offer this in the uh, box in the sanctuary. For example, your baby's sick or uh, something wrong with your lungs, maybe you have like breast cancer, or even for those who are pregnant. So you can choose and then offer it there and then pray. Over the years, Fatima has seen a lot of development because of the influx of pilgrims. 20 years ago, there was only one four-star hotel in this area. Now, Fatima boasts of 13 four-star hotels. Alexander says the hotels in Fatima and the food are very reasonably priced. Portugal is very successful today because the rates and prices are quite low. Not only in the hotels, but also the food. This is an affordable country. I wouldn't say it's for free, but if you compare it with other countries in Europe, this is probably one of the cheapest countries in the Western Europe. He, however, adds that the best part of going to Fatima is the spiritual nourishment that one gets from visiting Our Lady of Fatima. Each person that comes to Fatima usually leaves Fatima in a very personal way. And that personal way is different from the person to person. It's their, their own individual reasons. Some people arrive to Fatima with a lot of faith and, and it, they, they, they make that faith even stronger. Some people arrive to Fatima just as regular tourists uh, looking for a new photo mm -hmm. and they live with the heart uh, full. Portugal is rich in history and a colorful culture, but more significant are the miracles that occurred in its little town of Fatima. The messages that Our Lady of Fatima gave for all mankind at the dawn of the 20th century are now more than ever relevant during these present times. Our quote for today is from the Blessed Mother during her apparition on August 13, 1917. Pray. Pray very much and make sacrifices for sinners. For many souls go to hell because there are none to sacrifice themselves and pray for them. Thank you for watching. This has been Veronica Balit Jimenez saying everything is possible with God when we call on Him. Join us again next week for another interesting episode on Who's Calling? May God bless us all.